My name is Gavin Isaacs. I am the President and Chief Executive Officer of Scientific Games. So in that role, I'm responsible for everything. I grew up in Sydney, Australia, and I, I ended up getting a Bachelor of Commerce and a Bachelor of Laws degree down at the University of New South Wales and practiced for 12 years as a lawyer. I think law degrees become very useful because it teaches you a way of thinking, a way of, uh, of approaching problems and things. Um, it's interesting, when I was at school in year 11, uh, what do you call that, a junior, uh, in high school, at my school, the current Prime Minister of Australia came and spoke to the top two level of uh, students, and he said if you didn't know what you wanted to do, you should go off and do a commerce law degree, because uh, it's a great background to business, and that's what we did. Not because of what he said it, but that's, it was interesting he said that. And, uh, yeah, and I also got a Master's of Law degree during my career as a lawyer as well. So, um, As a corporate lawyer down there, which is working in a large law firm, and uh, doing transactional work, tax, corporate, structuring, property, that kind of stuff. I got a phone call out of the blue one day for someone said, would you like to get out of law? And I met them and it turned out to go to a company called Aristocrat, which was a gaming company out of Australia. And they were reforming, so I was part of the team that did that. And from the uh, like head of administration position, I ended up running marketing and business development. And after we made an acquisition in America, in 2002, I went off to run the European operations. Uh, the acquisition in America, the integration didn't go as planned, and I ended up being moved to America in 2003 as the president of Aristocrat in the Americas. Um, 2006, I made the decision I wanted to stay here, but left the Aristocrat, became the chief operating officer of Bally Technologies. And then in 2011, the opportunity came up to become the CEO of a company called Shuffle Master. Uh, which, we, which I did, and then in 2013, uh, Bally bought Shuffle Master. I ended up going and working out for a company out of New York who, were, who owned 40% of Scientific Games, and they had recently acquired WMS, another gaming company, and then when I joined, we uh, acquired Bally and Shuffle Master and put together what we have today as the uh, new combined Scientific Games. It's very unusual. Gaming is, uh, you know, you're creating entertainment for people. You're doing it in a way which is responsible, clearly. But you've got to make devices where people enjoy playing them. They have an opportunity to win, but they also understand that in the long term, they're paying for the entertainment. Um, the people in the industry um, are generally hospitable. You know, they're customer facing from our customer's perspective. Um, uh, it's a small industry, it's a unique industry by virtue of the skills. It's got barriers to entry by virtue of the, the regulatory side of it. And it's just evolved into a great fun industry. Uh, I used to enjoy uh, going to the horses and playing slot machines and things like that, but never did anything with gaming. At the end of the day, you've got engagement at different levels. We're a B2B provider primarily, with the exception of our social games, we're B2B. So um, we deal with the people, like it, be it the lotteries, be it the uh, casinos, the, the bars, the clubs, whoever it may be. And um, so, and they're all around the world. Obviously our business is global. We operate, I think it's, well, we're in six continents. I don't know the number of countries, but we have over 200 offices around the world. So we are everywhere. Everywhere there's some form of gaming we operate, probably with the exception of Japan. Because uh, Japan, we, I don't know, we just don't operate there. It's a different kind of machine. Uh, when I was an aristocrat, I set up the Aristocrat Japan office, but it's very unique, and I don't think we do the lotteries there. So, you know, by virtue of one thing or another, you've got to learn, you know, you've got to think global but act local. You know, there's an expression called glocal, uh, thinking globally but acting locally. So we have that commonality. That's the uh, thinking globally, acting locally but clearly the different customs and the different way of engaging people is different everywhere and you have to have local experts on the ground. So we have, you know, the way we operate as a company, we have one core mission statement and that is to empower our customers by creating the world's greatest gaming and lottery experiences. Um, 
then we have core values. So if you're in uh, our Beijing office, or if you're in our Sydney office, or if you're in our um, Vienna office, or if you're in our English office, or if you're in our South American office, doesn't really matter. We have six principal core values on how we expect people to conduct themselves. We play by the rules, we play uh, with integrity, we play uh, to win, we play to have fun, we play together and we play smart. I guess because we do have, we, we're ubiquitous in so far as we could put content out in every different format. Um, we have, you know, every, a lot of companies have games, a lot of companies have systems, a lot of companies have, uh, you know, instant tickets, a lot of companies have lotteries, a lot of companies have social games, interactive. Uh, no one has the table games and all of the others put together, so we can really bring something out across the whole board. And, and as a customer, we can provide you with everything. Um, and I also think we're unique because we have the best people. Well, we're an innovation, we're, we're a technology company more than anything else. I mean, that's at the end of the day, um, we are in gaming, but we're a technology company. We provide op, uh, products. So if you look at the way the equipment evolves, you know, with the exception of a table, which ultimately is just a table, and it has a math model in the, in the way the games are played, you know, even in that, you know, you've got shufflers that weren't around uh, 30 years ago. You've got uh, progressives now being rolled out on tables. You know, when you look at slot machines, effectively, that's a computer. And when you think of it as a computer, you know, like you, you guys are probably all running Apples or HPs or whatever, and they've probably got cloud-based memories and things like that. We build a game and a customer wants to keep it for 10 years. They want to keep it on 24 hours a day, seven days a week, okay? Pe they allow people to smoke over the top of them, spill drinks on them, push them, kick them. So we have to build a fairly durable computer um, we also have to do it in such a way that with innovation, you know, as we continue to evolve and make better and software to run on those games, the platform's powerful enough to continue to let it operate. Uh, so it's, it's a tough business. So it means that we really have to keep our eyes on technology and the trends. Um, you know, we have in each of our groups, we have innovation, we have technology, we have R&D, we have a CTO, we have an overall company CTO we make sure that we are looking at the future and we're looking, we're setting ourselves up to ensure that we build in the best formats and that we all use like an agile front end or whatever it might be. And we also, he also runs a group that's looking out over the horizon. We have product plans for current products that go for the next, say, five years, including what we're doing in the innovation lab. And then you can see some of those technologies, you know, a game goes on a floor at last 10 years. But you know, whilst we have that stream, you're also looking at this new kind of concept of what people are playing and you know, like eSports, things like that. How do I evolve that to make that an entertainment experience? We, we're always thinking about that as well. Well, social media is more immediate. You know, social media and social gaming, we're doing today. Uh, but virtual rea reality, we've been playing with that kind of concept. Um, you know, we, we, that, that group's based primarily in um, Pleasanton and Sil Silicon Valley. We've got some people here got some people in India, they all work together and they go out and look at what the trends are in the other industries. One thing about gaming is that we're highly regulated and everything gets highly uh, 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 checked out by the regulators and the testers before it goes on the floors because they're very concerned about ensuring player integrity, as are we. Uh, what that effectively means is that because government uh, entities are often testing them, they're not, not up to speed with the latest technology, so there's a bit of a lag. You know, if you use a surfing analogy, you know, waves come in sets of four, and the first wave, all the, the dot-coms and the, the young, you know, companies, you know, the very, very nimble companies might be jumping on that. We're probably on the second or the third wave. We're seeing what works and what doesn't, and then try to apply it. So a classic example would be uh, streaming. You know, we've, we've talked about downloadable gaming, but that's like taking a, a four gig game and putting it down onto a computer, down a pipe, like taking an elephant and shoving it down a little tube. Uh, it takes a long time to get it there. You can stream, you know, we've got an application now which we've got running out of Churchill Downs where you stream off the slot machine directly onto a iPad. Well, so if you're having a cigarette, you're not allowed to smoke there. Uh, you can stream the game off the machine onto this device. So it's still being played on the machine but you can go outside and play it and when you finish, you come back in. 
and you swipe the game back onto the machine and you keep playing. Yeah, I think Las Vegas was the center of the American casino industry. It, it started here. Um, it has a very unique, it's very favorable. The, the, it's, the state looks at it in a favorable manner. All the major manufacturers have, if not their, co their corporate headquarters like us, uh, their major US or operations at very least are out of here. So it's a great opportunity for the industry to get together. Most of the corporates are here. People like coming here. It's very easy uh, ingress and access, in, you know, for, to get people in and out of the place. Um, but I think the most important part of it is the historical background and the fact that, um, you know, in some parts of the world, people look at gaming and they go, you know, what? Like in Australia, uh, here people are proud of what they do, and there's a great amount of pride that the city's built back on the back of it. And so it's it's a great place to work in this industry. Okay, so I take that very seriously. You know, I love this industry, and I love the fact that people enjoy it, and I enjoy gaming, and uh, I think it's it's a stewardship that I take very seriously. I get concerned about um, some of the um, mass media ideas of what gaming is and isn't, and some of the ideas of what millennials like and what they don't like, and I think it's our responsibility working together to work out what is the best um, format for the future. You're always gonna have what we currently have. It may not be as big, it will evolve, but what can we do that's a bit differently that can make a casino, which is a great, fun place to go to, fun for all future generations? That's, I take that really seriously. It's, it's, it's an exciting part of the job. It's scary, but exciting. Casinos own the data. In the lottery, the lottery own the data. Online, we have a lot of data, we're collecting it and things like that. And we, we try and do a lot of testing and things. But uh, the thing about testing in our business, uh, I can put all you guys in front of a machine and you'll tell me it's great. And then when I say put your own money into it, I get a different answer. Yeah, it's very different. Every market's a bit different. Even in America, every market can be a little bit different. So what, what you're experiencing in Las Vegas on the Strip, for example, is different to what you get out in the local properties. So the local properties, people who work here, we all go there, we all play different games. You go to the strip, people might come three or four times a year. If that, they play a different kind of game. So, it, you know, it's, it's really is, it's very, very particular. In Macau, people play Baccarat, 90 plus percent Baccarat. Um, in Singapore, there's still more slots and electronic tables. In Australia, it's slots. Um, table game wise, Europe, Australia, Asia, outside of Macau and places like that, roulette. Here it's blackjack. So, you know, video poker is really only this state. So, you know, it, it's, it's very, it's, it's fascinating the differences. We do it everywhere. I mean, you know, obviously part of what we do is you have to make, you know, the games appealing and attractive. And that can be the entertainment. So we're about to launch our Cirque du Soleil game. And, you know, when you look at the features in that, it's a lot of fun. It's very, very attractive. That appeals to people. Well, I think there's always going to be a market for a mixture of the two. You know, I think that the, the big casinos at the moment are, are spending and investing heavily on the entertainment side. Um, I think a little bit more investment on the gaming side wouldn't hurt, speaking biasly, of course. But, no, obviously that, you know, if players come here and the, and the equipment's modern and it's fun and it's cutting edge and it's new, players will try it, but at the moment, you know, the investment dollars are going into new arenas and things like that, which is fine. We need to make Vegas a multi-purpose uh, uh, place to come, and if gaming is one of the things people they do, do when they get here, I think there's a long future for all of it. When you look at, um, when you're making products which are there for, for the purposes of uh, entertainment and thrills and fun and things like that, to have technology alone without the art, it's just not going to work. So, you know, what we always try and think of is when we, when, we, when we design a slot machine, for example, it's got to appeal to many of the sensors. You know, so we have great sound systems in them for the sound. They, they've got to be appealing on the eyes, they've got to be attractive. If it's, if it's an ugly looking colour scheme or it's an ugly looking game and there's no artistic appeal to it, people aren't going to play it. If ergonomically it's not attractive, if it doesn't look good, and if you sit in front of them, you're not comfortable, you're not going to play it. So it's really, it really is an incredible blend between uh, engineering and artist, artistry in that respect. And then at the end of the day, you're playing, you're gambling, you're just putting money into a machine. If you lose it so quickly, um, ultimately the answer is your math models aren't good enough. So the engineering and the IP around the actual game itself has to also be appealing. 
and artistic in, in, in a different kind of way. And then the games, the software has to depict these wins in an artistic manner. So overall, uh, I think it's a great blend between the two. That's just in that uh, scratch ticket on lottery is exactly the same. Uh, it's the same concept. In social games, it's exactly the same, even more so, because socially you're actually buying chips. You know, you can't win. You know, you're playing for leaderboards and you're playing for other kind of things. So, uh, you know, it really is a, a fine mix between the two.